Perfect. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time out for the session today. Um, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of uh, the lands on which we meet and pay respects to the elders past, present and um, emerging. For us today, that's the, the Ghana people. So why India? Oh, am I meant to give you the... Uh... <laughs> Now, thank you very much for coming over. It is, uh, in India is indeed, um, you know, where it's a land of opportunity at the moment. And uh, I have some wonderful stats that I can rattle off, but um, I thought before I begin, you know, the experts over here in the room will tell you all the stats and they'll they'll go through why India. Um, but what I wanted to do was, I read this article this morning and I just wanted to kind of read a quote from that article. Um, it was by Shane Elliott, the CEO of ANZ. So ANZ recently had um, their first board meeting outside um, of, uh, of Australia in India. So we had the entire ANZ board in India. And Shane Elliott, who's no stranger to India, actually um, his quote was, with a country developing and changing so quickly, each visit is an eye opener. And you learn that your perceptions of India are quickly out of date. So I think really kind of sets the scene. And you know we can talk you know, endlessly about the market and economy, about the government initiatives. We can uh, talk about the uh, innovation and startup ecosystem. The stats um, are just amazing and they're mind boggling in terms of when we look at, you know, the world's most populous nation and uh, what the opportunities for us are over there. But today is all about access to that opportunity. India is also a very complex market. India is also one of those markets where um, perceptions matter. Um, I am from New Delhi. And I've, uh, you know, I, I had a, a three-year break uh, of going back to seeing my my family. Went back after COVID and suddenly found that everything had changed. I didn't need cash anymore, and I couldn't use my cards anywhere because they use uh, they've got the most uh, advanced UPI system. So it 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 was mind-boggling to see how quickly things change. Um, but really, we've got a fantastic session for you here today. I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. Um, firstly, a big thank you to our partners, Department of um, South Australia Department of Investment and uh, Trade Investment. So together um, over here, we we work to um, to really kind of run sessions like this to to get people who are sitting on that India curious bucket. So my my colleague Smithy coined the phrase India curious, where you're kind of sitting on the edge going, you know, I, I want to go to India. I know it's a hard market. I know it's a complex market, but how can I learn more about it? So this, these sessions are all about giving you that information so you can start to think more, more clearly about why India. Um, and then when we are in country, so in India, for example, we work together, um, our, our colleagues at DTI and us, we work together to really, you know, um, make exporting simple for you. So exporting is complex. Um, the line I've been told that I need to, to read out is we simplified by providing advice, connections to opportunities and partners and solutions to challenges on the ground. So that's the official line, but in short, our success is your success. So if we can help you succeed commercially in India or anywhere else in the world, or you know where your export journey might take you, that's what's um, gonna be successful for us. So what, what are we doing um, as, Austrad as the federal government. So we've got one of the initiatives, which is the Australia India Innovation Network. So we've got various programs that we're running, um, and we'll we'll keep sharing the details of those programs. Um, we've just launched the um, the ITech program, which is the India Tech Export Catalyst program. Now that's for anyone that's looking to say, look, I want to understand more about about India. It's a six week um, experiential learning program where you hear from mentors and you hear from um, you know people who've been successful in India, and really gives you the foundations that you need uh, about setting up a business and being successful in India. We then 
complement that with um, on the ground missions and um, and uh, kind of you know delegations that we lead. So you know, in time when you're ready and you want to go to India, we've got various events, um, uh, various uh, missions that we lead around big events. So we've got uh, the Bengaluru Tech Summit that's coming up. We've got the Global FinTech Festival. Um, we've got you Imagine Chennai. All these events are just fantastic. I mean, the scale of these events in India is mind-boggling. And what we help is, um, or what we do is we take you with us, make sure that we you meet the right people, make sure you understand the regulatory framework and you know what what, what are the regulatory burdens that you need to kind of clear before you do uh, business in India and really help you kind of get started. So I might just stop there and actually pass on to, um, to Arthi Tekam, who's the senior manager at Vialto Partners for immigration and uh, global mobility. And we've now got a fantastic session, but it starts with Arthi. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Aarti Tekum. Um, just arrived to Adelaide last evening. I'm from Sydney originally. Um, it's been a beautiful day. So thank, thank God I'm in the right place. <laughs> Very good weather. Um, so I'm just going to be talking to you a little bit about uh, Vialto Partners, um, global mobility, um, your uh, move in internationally as well as into India. So. A little bit about the agenda, Vialto Partners, key considerations, traveling internationally with your business or yourself, um, and key considerations into India. And a little bit about Vialto Partners, a brief um, introduction. Um, we have moved out of PwC last year in May 2022. Um, we were part of PwC's um, Global Mobility Department, and now we have moved out to become Vialto Partners. We're located approximately 150 locations worldwide, um, and we've got 6,000 employees at Vialto Partners. So we, the main focus is on global mobility, immigration solutions, tax, payroll, anything to do with global mobility, moving companies from or individuals from one place to another, um, and, and we, we specialize in every, every possible uh, movement. So some of the um, some of the support that we provide our clients, like I said, tax compliance and consulting, social security, immigration, tax and permanent establishment advice, compensation and reward, business travelers, domestic and expat payroll, assignment services, um, equity support, and senior exec support as well. And just moving on quickly to um, key considerations as to cross border working. Um, just giving you some information about what cross-border working was and what it is right now. In the past, it was quite a streamlined, very, very um, straightforward. You would have long-term assignments, short-term assignments, and international transfers. Very simple. You want to move, you go there for long-term, short-term international transfers, go, go there and return. Now we have commuters, we have rotators, we have business travelers global nomads and in certain countries in the world right now you have global nomad visas um, which have which which have newly been introduced uh, project workers virtual assignments permanent international remote working short-term international remote working they're quite complex right now it, it, it it's not as straightforward as what it used to be um, the the key considerations which you need to understand right now is local hire versus international transfers your right to work in each of these locations and the policy considerations in each of these countries in your locations. You have to understand that these vary from different jurisdictions and you might get into trouble if you do not understand the policies and the compliance in each of these countries. So some of the considerations which I, which I was talking about, um, if when you consider expanding internationally, um, some of them would be immigration, do you have the right visa to work in, in that particular country? Personal tax, 
um, are your employees aware of the personal tax and uh, and their obligations? Social security in that company, corporate tax, um, whether, he, whether it's going to be a risk to them and whether it will be a risk to your company working, allowing somebody to work for you. If you are based in Australia and you have somebody working in Australia, would that complicate your scenario as being an employer? Is that going to give you, is that going to, is that going to benefit the employee sitting over there with regards to the tax, cross-border tax compliance issues? Payroll, do you need to set up a payroll in the remote location? Um, you would have in, in Europe, you would have the posted uh, workers directive in, in the sense you would get really, uh, you know, it's, it's a hefty penalty if you have um, someone working in France and you are located somewhere else, or if you're working in Belgium or wherever, wherever, the, wherever the country is located, you have to make sure, especially in Europe, that you are looking into that particular country, um, the, the, the PWD directive, which is, which is known as the Posted Workers Directive. Cybersecurity, if there are any country, countries which do not support remote working, is that is that, uh, is that where your employee or yourself who's going to be working at? You need to consider whether you can be sitting in a country doing remote work when you're not allowed to do remote work. Um, your governance in each of those countries and the wellness, of course, for your employees as well. So I've given you some information about um, the different types um, within your mobile workforce, you would have um, a short-term remote worker, permanent remote worker, business travelers. Business travelers are travelers who have to continuously move from one place to the other. So you have someone who's in business development in your company. Um, tomorrow you have to be in India for two months um, working on some business opportunity out there. You get a call, he gets a call or she gets a call and he has, she has to move from India to UK, from there move to the US. Um, are they able to move in that span of time with the right visa, with the right work um, um, authority, with, with the payroll being taken into consideration? Are you all right with the tax compliances and the payroll as well? So um, you, you, and, and some of these, and some of these uh, business travelers need to be in a certain location at the right time to sign a deal. Are you compliant? I, do you have the right visas do you have the right information to send these people over to, to new york within a week or two can can he or she do it those those are the you know the, these are some few things that you need to consider before you even um you know having that conversation with your clients um to say yes you will be there in two weeks um hybrid remote workers project workers and regional role. I've given some few examples over there um, to just make you understand what short-term remote workers are. Um, for example, some of, and these are really live scenarios that we have encountered. Um, we have a client saying, I value my personal flexibility and would like to work from my second home in France every winter. So for nine months in a year, he would love to work in Australia and then three months in France. Now, how, that, how is that going to, you know, um, jeopardize my company if I'm, if, if I'm here? Is it all right for him to work over there in France for three months? Um, what are the tax obligations that I have to consider? What are the, um, how is he going to be paid? Can I pay him from Australia to India? Is that sending him, sending him that payment every, every month for the next three months on annually every year for three months in a row? Is that all right? Um, is, 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 is the tax, is the tax ATO going to be, what, what are they going to say to me? These are some few considerations you have to think. Um, and then you have somebody in, um, Singapore, um, family situation is not, you know, they don't allow me to, you know, basically is not, um, in his, in his, um, sorry, I was going to say in his, um, in the family situation that he has cannot relocate. So I, so he wants to work in Australia. But his, but his role is in Singapore. So basically 12 months in a year working in Australia, but his role is in Singapore. Is that even possible? Remote worker, is that, is that all right? So um, is, how, how is it going to work? Does he need to travel to Singapore at least once a month or once in a quarter? Um, if, he is, if he is based out of Singapore and his payroll is in Singapore, his employment 
um, permanent employment is in Singapore and he's based in Australia, getting a pay, getting his salary in Australia, but if he has to travel to Singapore, what visa is the right visa for him to apply to get to Singapore? Because he's working in Singapore. Does he need a work visa or does, does he require a business visa? What is the right visa? Um, and, and these can actually, these questions are very important for you to consider because these are part of your mobility. These, it's very complex in terms of the government rules, in terms of each country has different government rules, which you need to be aware of, and you need to contact your specialist who are aware of these rules on the ground for you to get the right advice. It is very important for you to get the right advice. So that, what I've said before is more to do with just moving globally, internationally, does not matter, any part of the world. Your considerations for India, um, some of the um, immigration considerations for India would be your employment visa. If you wanna get, if you wanna move from Australia, say you wanna go there for one year, work there, just to check how the situation is, build your company, um, expand expand um, your product, your company, your services. Um, what is the right visa that you need to be holding? Um, so in that case, if you're gonna be staying there in India and working, definitely, definitely you need an employment visa. Um, dependent visas, obviously, as the name suggests, it is for your family to accompany you, a, a company, sorry, to join you in India. Uh, business visa and e-business visa. Now, the reason why I put that two different is because the business visa is allowed for certain passport holders. Um, e-business visas uh, are allowed for certain passport holders. E-business visas, Australia, New Zealand. Um, nationals can apply for an e-business visa. Um, business visas are for other countries who, who, and UK is one of those countries right now. Um, and I believe they will move on to the e-business visa, but right now UK, is falls under the business visa, which means they have to do all the uh, manual physical paperwork to apply for a business visa. Under business visa, it's very straightforward what you can do and what you cannot. Um, you obviously have to get there. You can only do business, um, organize your meetings. Um, you set up an industrial business uh, venture, but you cannot work. It's just purely business reasons. So I've just, just casually just put something together just to show you what an immigration process in India looks like. So I've just given you an example. Mr. Adelaide is an Australian national. He intends to enter India for the purpose of taking up employment, applies for an Indian employment visa based on his job description. And when you apply for an Indian business, uh, sorry, an employment visa, please know that you cannot just go there um, applying for any job, it has to be a specialist job and which an, an ordinary Indian is not qualified enough to do that job. Um, so you need to have some sort of um, specialized reason and your job has to be specialized in nature to actually enter India um, to apply for an employment visa. So you apply for the Indian visa, you arrive in India and within 14 days of arrival, a foreign national has to register with the Foreigners Registration Office, which is known as the FRRO. So it's a mandatory requirement. And if you don't do that, there's penalties uh, associated with that. So as an Indian, uh, sorry, a, a foreign national uh, passport holder, you have to register yourself with the FRRO. And uh, any of your personal circumstances changes within the duration of your visa whilst you are in India, you would have to notify the department, I mean, the department, which is the FRRO, within a certain period of time. And it depends on what the circumstances are. For example, um, with, a, with regards to your um, change of address, it would be a certain period of time that you have to um, notify the department. Then if you have um, a requirement to extend your visa from two years to four years, you would have, you, you can do it while you are there. And then once you leave India, you have to conduct and you have to complete a deregistration process. And that's a mandatory requirement as well. So compliance, like I mentioned before, um, some of the compliance that you have to do when you receive your um, visa stamp into your passport and when you enter India, you would have to have, you have 14 days of arrival that you need to register yourself with the FRRO. Um, visa extension, 
um, to be undertaken 60 days prior to the visa expiry date. Your um, residential permit extension as well would be 60 days. Like I said before, change of address, which has to be within eight weeks. Um, new passport, passport update, if you are actually your passport expires while you're there, you need to mention and you've got to, and, you know, you've got to um, complete a form and notify the department within four weeks from the issuance of the new passport. Now, these, I just want you all to understand that this is just not a requirement for India. Every country has their own compliance issues. So Australia, for, for example, the subclass 482 visa, which is a work visa in Australia, you have to undergo and, and be compliant with certain conditions uh, applied on that visa. For example, the sponsor for a 482 will have the sponsor own sponsorship obligations and the holder of the 482 have their own obligations as well in terms of have if they change an address, you have 28 days to notify the Department of Home Affairs. The sponsor has to notify the Department of Home Affairs of the last, they have 28 days if someone who holds a 482 pass uh, visa um, um, resigns from their um, position. They have 28 days to notify the department. So every country has their own compliance and India, these are the compliance you need to abide in India. Okay, just giving you a start, um, some information about the um, investments in India. The um, There's been a lot of uh, foreign direct investment uh, each year into India. And in the financial year 2022-23 stood at USD uh, 70.97 billion, which is significant, massive amount of money in. The top sectors um, receiving this foreign direct investment is services, which is 16%, computer software and hardware, 15%, trading, 6%, telecom, 6%, and automobile, and 5%. The top five states with highest FDI inflow is Maharashtra, 29, where Mumbai, I'm pretty sure most of you know where Mumbai is, and Maharashtra is the state. Um, Karnataka, 24%, Gujarat, 17 Delhi, 13 and Tamil Nadu, 5%. The FDI limits, India generally allows 100% FDI in an entity barring new sectors such as defense, media, insurance, trading, et cetera. Um, but if you need to get into one of those industries, um, you need to get government approval and, um, and, and possibly you know, understand what the next steps are. Your business structures um, to enter India, um, you can be set up as a private limited company, a uh, limited liability partnership, LLP, um, branch project office, liaison office in India. The company and LLP, L LLP are the popular forms of businesses in India. While the government has provided incentives to startups, the same is not applicable to subsidiaries of foreign entities. Um, so to start up as a company in an LLP, which is the most common uh, setup and startup in, um, in India, the minimum two, you've got to have minimum two directors, partners to register a company or LLP in India. At least one resident director partner is mandatory. Approval of the name of the company um, and incorporating a company generally takes 20 to 30 days. And following that, you would, you would obtain your in, income tax, GST, labor law registrations, et cetera. Some of the compliances for company LLP is annual and periodic filings with the Ministry of Corporate Affairs Tax Authorities, uh, preparation of financial statements, transfer pricing compliances. Um, you would obviously have to maintain HR admin policies as well when you move in um, to India and start up a company. Uh, monthly and annual compliances for labor-related laws. Um, there are some incentives to businesses. Um, for example, the production-linked incentives, um, and it covers up to 13 sectors like automobile, electronic systems, pharmaceuticals, telecom, and, uh, and, it, and, and the incentives depend on in incremental sales, and companies can opt to receive these in incentives. You also have state-level incentives, depending on the state that you are going to be looking into getting and in, setting up your business, and the various state-level subsidies provided are to attract um, investments um, such as power subsidies, land grants, 
depending on the quantum and area of investment and the employment opportunities you provide to local Indians. Income tax, um, you would have reduced income tax rate at 15% and 22% for domestic companies, depending on the nature of activities. So I think it's best to get in touch with an expert once again, for you to get that advice as to what, be what benefits you can get and which is the right state that you should be looking into before you move into India, whether Gujarat is the best place or Karnataka or Maharashtra, depending on the business that you have and what is the um, uh, uh, what are the incentives, whether, whether you're going to benefit having your business starting up in this particular state versus the other state. As um, some of you know, there has been um, um, the, the Prime Minister of India and Prime Minister of Australia uh, met in um, May and they exchanged the um, Australian-India um, Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement, which is um, in short known as the ECTA. Um, this is the first trade agreement in India with a developed country after more than a decade. Everyone has been looking forward to this. There's been amazing um, uh, it, it, the, the feedback and, and the, uh, the noise around it has been significant. Um, and um, what I've covered here is more to do with the immigration uh, aspect of it in terms of post-study work visas, which is, um, which is opened up a lot of uh, venues for students here who are Indian nationals studying here in Australia, where if they're studying a trade or, um, or, or a diploma, they, the, they can stay up to 18 months after their course finishes. If they have finished a bachelor degree for stays up to two years, um, and also if it is a, a, a master of research or coursework for three years and a PhD for four years. Similarly, um, this is a reciprocal for India as well, Australians getting into India, so which is good. Um, and there's the MATES program, which is a key feature of this agreement, um, which is known as the Mobility Arrangement for Talented Early Professional Scheme. And there are 3000 spots each year. Um, for young professionals from India to spend two years in Australia without needing a visa sponsorship. So ideally, if anyone needs to come into Australia, they have to have a sponsor to sponsor them to come into India. But with this MATES um, program, and it's only available just for 3,000 um, on a yearly basis. So you, th there are some criteria for the Indian nationals to meet in order to qualify for this program. Um, and this starts from 1st of July, 2023. Similarly, Australian graduates who want to get into India and they want to work um, um, without a sponsor, this, this scheme is available to them as well. And, and once again, there is a criteria that needs to be met. Work and holiday visa, which is, which is a lot of people are looking forward to it, uh, for the young um, Indian nationals, which is subclass 462 for, um, and it's only available thousand squats in a year, um, where um, you can have um, the young um, Indian nationals between 18 and 30 years old to apply for the, one of this work and holiday visa. But obviously they have to qualify as well, the criteria set for it, and that'll come into force after 1st of July. Um, and uh, to, visit in, to visit Australia, and, it's, and, and work and holiday visas uh, mistakenly are known as work visas, but you know, People tend to use them as work visas, but they are not work visas. It's like the name says, it is a work and holiday. Basically, they enter the country to holiday, but substantiate their income by working as well. So, um, so that's so. So this is some of the. Um, I haven't gone into depth with the ECTA only because it's like a few pages which you'll have to go through it. The tax and payroll and all other um, um, incentives for Australians and Indians. Um, in both ways, but I just thought I'd touch highlight on the immigration aspects of it. So that's it. Um, that's that's me. Um, if you all have any questions with regards to global mobility into any of the countries, um, we specialize just not into India with every other country, um, but my speciality is in India. Thank you so much, Arfi. Um, there will be a quiz after. So if you were paying attention to those tax rates, that'll be important. Um, why was this important? Exceptionally good to try and get this level of information at whatever stage of the journey you were at with your export to India or anywhere else in the world. Really important considerations um, on mobility, 
um, incentives for businesses and uh, just the practicalities of setting up businesses in a market like India. Um, I mentioned it is, you know, there's a lot of opportunity and you touched on the ECTA. We're also um, negotiating what's called the SICA, which is um, in essence going to be the, the full free trade agreement. And um, definitely looking at a lot of opportunities coming up for Australian businesses looking to enter India. Um, so this kind of information, I mean, this is just a teaser, obviously don't expect you to be experts, but this is just to try and give you um, a bit more kind of practical information in these sessions. Why is that important? India's digital technology, um, the, the industry recorded a 15.5% growth in uh, financial year 2022. And in the next two years, so by 2025, they expect it to be uh, the digital economy to be a, a $1 trillion uh, industry. So you know, the numbers are staggering. The opportunity is phenomenal. It's just making sure that we help you navigate. Um, I'd like to just pass over to my um, good friend, Tim White. Tim White is the director at uh, the South Australia Department of Trade and Investment and was most recently Trade and Investment Commissioner uh, to India for Austrade as well. So, Tim. Thank you, Vic, and it's good to see you again, have you here in Adelaide. I'll be very brief, but um, just, just wanted to, uh, I guess, pick up on a couple of points that um, Vic mentioned earlier. Um, in particular, just you know, going back to that opening question of why India, um, as Vic said, I had the good fortune of spending the last sort of two and a half years in Delhi with Austrade. Um, and I guess one of the reflections I've got, and I think something that none of us should underestimate is um, that the momentum in the relationship is very real and it's real for business as well. Uh, so, I mean, I think we've all seen the news around, you know, two-way prime ministerial visits uh, we've seen the free trade agreement, the ECTA, which, as Vic says, is the interim agreement. There's more coming. Um, and there's a range of other government initiatives that have been rolled out um, in support of, you know, that bilateral relationship. But I saw on the ground in Delhi that it's very real. Uh, it opens doors for us in government. It also opens doors for business in a way that, um, if, if we're frank, we've not seen that in the past with the Australia-India relationship. So we're in a really unique new space in the relationship. And I, I guess that's why I think events like this are really important for those who are, as Vic said, India curious. Um, really now is the time to be even more curious than you ever have been. Um, and um, and I guess just extension, extending on that uh, and what Vic said about the programs that Austrade has, um, I, I guess I wanted to just talk about the ecosystem of support that you've got here in Adelaide. Um, so we'll hear shortly from Hemant, who's uh, Manager for Services and Tech Exports at our department, which is the South Australian Department for Trade and Investment. Uh, his team, Hayley and Sonia, are here today. Um, they're here to support you. And I, I guess what I'd say is, um, you know, at DTI, we've got a group of people on India who are true believers. Um, and it's really important um, because we need to be really clear eyed about both the opportunity and the risk with a market like India. And that's where we try with our partners at Austrade, like Vic and Smriti. Um, and of course, with our investment team, Chris is here today from the investment team, Sonia and our international team, which includes our network offshore. Um, we're trying to provide you with really clear, frank, uh, accurate advice on where the opportunity lies and what your risks might be. Um, and I guess in a market like India, that's particularly important um, from my perspective because I, I've, in my career, worked in India, worked on China. They're very different markets, but there's one similarity there, and that is that they are continental sized markets. We saw some of the stats, we've heard from Vic about that. Um, these are not markets that are easy to navigate. Um, it's not you know, biting off all of India at one time. You need to be very clear and targeted about the strategy that you have, the geography that you're targeting, the demographic, um, the customers and their interests. Um, so all of these things in a market like, like India are hugely complex. Um, and that's where our team can provide you with hopefully really good advice that can support you to get into the market. And just one final plug on Vic's behalf for, um, for the, the team uh, in India, and that is the Austrade team and our DTI representative. They are a fantastic, hugely talented, deeply networked group of professionals. Um, and we don't charge for our services. We are here, as Vic said, to support you in your success. So I'd really encourage you to access that ecosystem here in Adelaide, but also to talk to the team on the ground in India because they have, in my view, the best possible insights that they that you can get um, from 
uh, in terms of the Australia India specific opportunity, and of course we're talking South Australia here. So, just a bit of a plug for that uh, ecosystem that's around you to support you, um, and please do reach out to our team. Um, I think the next stage is uh, we're going to hear from a few people from industry about their insights on India as well. So I'm going to introduce Hemant, who will chair that panel. So as I said, Hemant Padale is our manager for services and tech exports at DTI. Um, he's also spent time with Austrade in India previously, a lot of experience on the South Asian market. So uh, Hemant's going to take us through the panel discussion. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So a lot of people, um, previous speakers have mentioned about uh, India and really India throws up a big numbers and uh, it's really complex sometimes when it comes to kind of uh, understanding the market and I've been working with Austrade uh, uh, doing from the other side, helping businesses and now coming here and kind of advising businesses. It's a tricky market. It's a long-term market, but uh, market of opportunity, uh, as we all know. Uh, so you heard uh, the mobility side, you heard the big number side, but it's really those people who have kind of been in the market, have worked in the market, listen from them, what their experiences are, what the learnings are, and to really kind of uncover um, how you could look at India and why India and being more curious, as Tim said. So uh, I would like to introduce and uh, bring up uh, Mark Carey from uh, Hydrodex. He's the chief operating officer or Chief Executive Officer with uh, uh, with Hydrodesk and Hydrodesk uh, is a water treatment company. They've been in uh, India for over eight years now, uh, and um, yeah, uh, and a lot of experience of working both with government and private sector. Uh, Benjamin uh, Benjamin Elangovan, uh, tech entrepreneur, founder with uh, multiple startup, but primarily with My Gigsters. Um, and it's uh, related to gig economy, and he's also the resident in Lot 14. So some of you might know him. Uh, and Samsung Selderai, um, also uh, a tech entrepreneur and uh, based in Adelaide. And he works, uh, has a company based out of Chennai, uh, which is a tech entrepreneurship company, but currently working on a women's safety app, which is called as I'm Safe, uh, and trying to launch it from Adelaide. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, and I'll just keep it much more informal and conversational. So. Uh, Please feel free to kind of jump in if you have any any comments which are kind of not uh, or adding to you to the panelist uh, comments. Uh, I'm gonna start uh, with you, Mark. Uh, given that you have done multiple visits to India, um, uh, had been on various delegations. Uh, what is your experience about India? Uh, where do you see what are the challenges? And if you look at given yours a small enterprise company. Uh, and that's the really a big numbers that we're talking about. So how do you do you went about India and your experience? Thanks, Hammett. The I guess um, prior to COVID, I was traveling to India three or four times a year, spending between 30 and 45 days a year in country. So I've spent a fair bit of time over there trying to uh, you know make it work for our company. I found India to be an exciting and challenging country from how it can wow you with its grandeur and then confront you with its poverty. They're the two extremes of the country that, you know, they surprise, delight and make you sorry and wonder what's going on. Um, the, the wow in business is the large market potential. It is huge. It is absolutely huge. The confrontation for me is the competitiveness of the market and it's learning how to do business in India. Um, you commonly hear, given the size of the market, we only need a small percentage of the market to be successful. That's true. That is very true. But without the right strategy and a local partner, you'll find it very hard. That's our experience. Um, you also need to understand any of the regulatory approvals that apply to your product and whether they're at a state level or a national level or well, federal level for us, okay? So state or federal approvals. Um, Hydrodis is a water treatment technology. Therefore, we need regulatory approval from the national government to bring the product to market in India because we treat drinking water. It's an, it applies in every country we go into, we need to get regulatory approval. We have to have a system to make it, to get that, to get the data to have it done, have that approval processed. Um, if you run a company that makes electronic components, 
you probably only need a CE tick and you'll be okay because that's accepted over there. Um, just how it is, it is what it is. Um, we've made lots of mistakes in our journey. The two main ones we have was having a preconceived idea about how many distributors we needed in a country as big as India. We entered the country with the mindset that no one company could do it all. Um, unfortunately for us, it cost us probably the best market access opportunity on our second visit. We, were able, we could have partnered with a really successful company in India who could do it all, but we just couldn't see it. Um, and then it took too long to get the partner we had. So a preconceived idea of, you know, India is so big, no one can do it all. In India, there may well be because there are some huge companies <laughs> up there that can do some of the most amazing stuff in the world. So um, don't go in with a preconceived idea. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Uh, I might just get to the tech side of things and uh, get Samsung to share your views on the tech market and how different it is. And I know that you've been uh, also working in other global markets, but what's the Indian tech market opportunity looks like and how, what's the unique challenges or opportunity do you see? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, nice to meet you all here. Uh, with regards to the tech market in India and why it is different, I can straight away think of two factors. Uh, number one, it is the talent pool that we have for technology. So um, like, for example, you go to Bengaluru or Hyderabad or Chennai, the access to talent, the access to tech talent is actually very huge and it's more easy to access. I think that is a game changer for any tech companies, uh, you know, because we can have uh, uh, like, you know, good people, but if they leave or, you know, as a backup, the, the turnaround time is very important. So that you have very, uh, you have very good talent pool in India and that makes a lot of difference. And it's also not just access to any talent, but access to good talent, because uh, it's no point in having a, a you know, a developer and realizing that he's not good at what he's doing. So you need to have the good talent and access to that talent, which you have in India. That's number one. And number two, um, language is a big game changer. Um, most of the uh, uh, people in India or you know, tech guys in India, they speak English. Uh, there are some who don't, but most of them do, at least the senior level uh, people who do. And that is uh, makes a big difference because um, we have worked with different uh, companies because we are in the virtual reality space as well. One of the other countries that is very good in VR is uh, South Korea. But the big disadvantage they have outside the good tech they have is that the language. So in this context uh, two of the big uh, positives in india is one is the access to talent and number two is the language thank you uh, benjamin this is like going deep into it and getting into your experience so what factors do you consider when it comes to product market fit and this is one of the important factor because india being so vast and yet there are smaller markets within so how do you consider the factors for product market fit and also uh, if somebody wants to kind of get into the first customer how do you get to that kind of thing that i want to kind of tap into my first consumer what are the things that they need to strategize or think about ah great great question i'm trying to kind of steal the answers from everybody else uh, but so uh, before that context setting thank you so much for having me here i run two businesses a fintech company called my Kicksters. we heavily support self-employed people uh, in financial services based here on level two and now expanding to India over the next year. Um, startup number two, which is called Megamind, as you can see that I'm a big fan of Megamind cartoon. That's what we named it. So um, what we do is we build custom softwares for clients across the globe and 90% uh, of clients are from Australia. Um, so it's basically a software development company. So I've got a service company and a product company. Now you've got the context. Good. So um, Talking about my gigsters, fintech, I'm truly relate with the, it's a regulated uh, space. Anything that you want to do of any scale has to go through um, due diligence and compliance. Um, talking about, uh, we are working with self-employed space. 
for me, the market in India actually is way too bigger than in Australia. In Australia, we've got 2.1 million self-employed. In India, I've got literally 7.2 million gig workers. So you see that the size. But um, now in our solution here has a list of uh, items in our menu card um, that we offer to our customers. Now, not essentially the same items would work there and in the same order. Like what I mean by saying that is, Something that was a pain point here is not of the same intensity there. Example could be if you ask a self-employed person in Australia, what's your biggest problem of being a sole trader? They'll say taxes. And you go to India and you probably not hear the same thing there. So you got to know which pain point works for that particular market. And that market is also varied. So you got tier one having a different intensity to tier two to tier three. Same user, but different paint intensity, which means they will have different ways to buy your product. Next thing is, who do you partner with to get your first customer? And um, um, one thing that has worked for us is partnerships. So uh, understanding who has um, the credibility and the trust among the community. Um, India, uh, as much as complex and dynamic it is, it has also got strong uh, emotional connection. So they, I would trust him on a brand that I've never used because I just trust him. Yeah, so if you just got that authentic. So a, a partner that has got that credibility and trust always helps you to get to the first customer. The last thing is um, uh, getting it go on the first run is probably very rare. <laughs> So you, you should be prepared to see some failures, some uh, lack of you know, disengagement or expectation mismanagement or something that would come out of the blue. Um, so landing your first customer would probably not happen. It's going to happen somewhere down the line. Yep. That's fair enough. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And that brings to the factor about uh, given the vibrancy of the uh, tech market, uh, the, both the PE, uh, the, the venture capital looks been active there. What factors do you consider when somebody is pitching uh, in market and trying to look at uh, the the areas around, even to pitching to a to the pot potential partner or to a to a VC or a or a private equity player? What do you think that need to be considered? Yeah, so I would say the first thing is uh, the people. Who are you working with? I think that is very, very important and significant there. Uh, when you're accompanying the Indian context, as Benjamin said, it's uh, who you know more than what you know. Um, and uh, the second one is, I would say, to I mean, when you're working across countries, it's always good to go through reputed firms, like you know, in terms of VC investment. So uh, one of our companies, we uh, in discussions for uh, uh, you know a VC of uh, private equity, and we are engaging some of the well-reputed firms because that gives uh because sometimes what happens is firms in their silos don't understand the full regulations and there are a lot these are very complex things um just for example to get uh an investment fund from australia to india you got to get the approval of the bank you got to get the approval of reserve bank of india you got to like you know there is a lot of uh you know things that you have to go through so i would say uh, work with the right people and the engaging the right firms that really makes a big difference Thank you. Benjamin, uh, given, uh, again, tech uh, looks at a lot of uh, intellectual properties and data sharing, uh, your views around how do companies uh, kind of look at IP protection as well as from a data protection point of view and, and some of the regulatory aspects. And, and I would actually like your comment as well after, after Benjamin, given that how you are going about protecting your IP. Um, it's a, it's, Good question. I'm going to answer this from the software development side that we have because we actively work on a number of projects where startup founders are based here and they build their products offshore, including Mike Express, my dev team sits there. I've got uh, my senior exec team here. Um, so uh, IP assessment and stuff at, uh, you know, you can do the contracts and stuff. That's the standard book answer, but I'm not going to touch that. Um, is to follow on the point that you, may, you have to do your due diligence on your partner, um, knowing that they've got the right business, the processes, uh, the team and the culture that they're operating on. And you could take your time to get there. And that's usually where a, a contract complements the thing. And in terms of technical work, for example, uh, our developers can't access MyGixters 
sitting there. They could access my gigs test through an infrastructure that we have established only them can access because the data is residing within Australia. We got to comply with the Australian data security principles and stuff. So there are ways to navigate uh, data sharing, data integrity and sovereignty risks. Um, um, but there's technical options there. It's about working within the partners that you can and they acknowledging, embracing and appreciating that uh, point of it. There is a large uh, uh, market where they don't really understand IP and, and data confidentiality really well. Um, and often that's where all the risk eventuates. Thanks. Um, we've taken a multifaceted approach to our IP. Um, the core of our IP is held in the coating on the plates that treat the water and in the way we control the electricity. So we have two parts to it. The control IP, we have had to release into India to our distributor in India and our manufacturer so that they can build product. That's the simple fact of it. They've got to have what they've got to have to do their job. Um, the cell plates, the, the coating on the plates, we have that made here in Australia and we ship that in as either finished goods or as plates which are turned into finished goods by a distributor. Um, we have taken out a number of patents in India to do with the design of our equipment, um, which we've done in China and other countries we've gone into. But uh, we rely on you know the, the the confidentiality agreements, the um, you know the, the legal structures as much as we have to. And strategically, we release what we need to release, but hold what we need, we can't hold, what, what we have to hold to protect our technology. Um, yes, we can be reverse engineered. Um, they can reverse engineer in terms of knowing how much of certain products we've got on the plate. But part of our IP is how we put it on the plate and when we put it on the plate. So they might be able to work out what we've done, but they won't be able to work out how we do it. So. That's why we do it that way. But you have to give them what they need to do their jobs. And if you want them to build your product, that you've got to release a lot of stuff and you need to make sure you've got the safeguards in place. Can I add a point? Yeah, yeah I'll just like to add a point. From my experience, I'll give two uh, examples. So one is uh, uh, one of my friend, he had investment from a Swedish company in uh, in Chennai. So what the, the Swedish did uh, was um, all the business that they were doing, they were connecting with the, the Swedish India council the business council so similarly like the the important thing about a meeting here is that you can be well connected with Austria and the india australia business council so when you go into a uh, business in a different a city in india you can always be connected there so that gives a bit more leverage for you in terms of whatever any legal uh, help you need a uh, number two directly into the tech for some of the um, customers we work with across the globe, uh, we are also a services company. So what we do is we give an exclusive um, like access and passwords to them where they have the username and password. So, you know, we don't uh, own, like, it's like, you know, in, in the tech where we use um, uh, codes where you can upload it, but we can't download it, that kind of uh, different structures. But yeah, you can uh, know a bit more about that to protect your IP as well. Thank you. Mark, uh, moving on from IP, it's more on the cultural aspect and India and Australia have great cultures. So uh, you have kind of witnessed a lot of uh, cultures and business etiquettes and uh, would have gone through a lot of kind of learnings uh, during your multiple visits. Your views on how to one business should adapt or to Indian cultures and business etiquettes? Yeah, thanks, mate. Um, one of the big appeals is the fact that India is very British in the way it does things. Its legal system is based on a similar one to ours. Um, they speak English very well in most cases. Um, so, and the business structures and laws, you can have confidence in them, in them because they're modelled on the similar basis to ours. Um, one thing on my first trip, I don't know whether it was you, Hammett, but yeah. one of the people, one of the um, Austrade advisors said to us, you need to remember about India is that the British invented bureaucracy and the Indians perfected it and they <laughs> sure did um, and that's not having a go at them it's just the, the way they, they make it very complex bureaucratically to get through some of the systems um, having said that the day-to-day -day interactions that we had were just like building a business relationship here in Australia 
it's not really much difference. Um, the cultural and etiquette impacts really come into how you move through the process and the impacts of where you are doing business. Religion is one, an incredibly diverse religious culture in, in India. Um, but the one of the things that it took some getting your head around was, well, for me anyway, was the fact that the majority of India, of India is a Hindu yeah. and the majority of those are vegetarian. But they're not all vegetarian. Some are, some aren't. Some drink alcohol, some don't. And in some parts of India, they even eat beef. So it's a, you know, you've got to get your head around this really complex um, way of thinking. They see the same thing, but they look at it differently. Um, and, and that's not a problem. You just have to work with it. My my note here is that the best way to do it is to roll, be guided by the people you work with and roll with it. Some of the best meal experience I've had in India have been vegetarian meals. Um, and like last July, I was in India, um, caught up with Tim. Um, that day was my birthday, the day we caught up, believe it or not. <laughs> um, and I celebrated my birthday in Delhi with a, a couple of other Australians in a vegetarian restaurant that didn't serve alcohol. Now, those that know me like, no, I like a good red wine. So I didn't get to celebrate my birthday. To be perfectly honest, I was that shag from the trip. I didn't need it. <laughs> um, a key takeaway is never underestimate the value of having the high, having high ranking government officials with you. Some of the best opportunities and doors that we found or opened up for us were the result of having the minister or a former politician with us. Um, an example, we sat down on our first visit with the minister who was leading the delegation with the Delhi Water Board. So that's like sitting down here and talking and sitting around the table with SA Water. That's a fairly impressive door to be open to you. That's a door that hasn't progressed too much, but I think that's because we probably haven't got the political influence to get back through the door. Um, you know, we had a, we, in order to get that regulatory approval I mentioned earlier, we built a pilot plant in Jaipur and installed it on a, in a university on a women's hostel and supplied safe drinking water. And we used that in partnership with the university and the Rajasthan government to get the data we needed for the regulatory approval we needed. It worked really well um, from our point of view, but the benefit of the network was the fact that we, that plant was, we installed it and it was commissioned by the state governor, Hugh Van Lay. The state trade minister was in attendance. Hammett was part of the team that helped set that up for us. Gave us some incredible exposure, some incredible credibility because Australian ministers were there, state ministers were there, and federal ministers were there. That's the, that's the power of a high profile person. Um, so just never underestimate the value of those sorts of opportunities that, that someone who has the credibility because of their position will create for you. And this is where it kind of becomes important to use government at all level, whether it is federal or state. Uh, and Tim pointed out the, the network that the business development managers have on ground is there to open doors. This is the important part, uh, working with government. Uh, Hammer, can I just say that one one of uh, the saying that I came away from my first trip to India was the mission allowed op found us doors on streets we wouldn't have even found. You know, they opened that door to the Delhi Water Board. We would never have gotten it. We haven't got back to them. We can't get near them because we haven't got the clout with us to do it. So it's a great opportunity. Uh, this is for you both, given your backgrounds again in tech side. Uh, any government incentives or programs uh, that, uh, that a South Australian or an Australian tech entrepreneur looking at engaging in India should be considering and looking at that support from a startup ecosystem? Um, there are. Um, um, obviously, they're, they're different to uh, homegrown uh, startups to foreign uh, investments and she did, but the presentation clearly laid out there are state and national wide benefits for uh, businesses and each state has got their own um, economic zone that they want to create you know uh, we've got the 
gig city happening in Gujarat. Um, and we've got similar hotspots that are happening and that's they are designed carefully to attract foreign investments and the companies to come there a bit like a uh, bit like the Middle East pattern. But uh, those, those, those opportunities give you tax incentive and access to uh, all the way from land to workspaces, that kind of thing. Uh, if a company is based in India and they've got, uh, like for us, um, we've got an entity that's based in India because I'm still an Indian passport holder. So I've got that uh, opportunity to do that. I get a certain additional benefits that foreign companies don't get, which is usually startup grants and access to capital and access to talent and all of that stuff. So the reason why I'm saying this is you can also find partners who have got to add access to those benefits. And by being partnered with them, you get a little bit of leverage on using that benefits too. Yeah. Samsung, any question that you? Yeah, I mean, I think Benjamin covered most of it. Uh, adding to that, one thing I can think of is there's a lot of uh, government uh, loans at very low interest available for SMEs. And uh, also there's, like he mentioned about the, they give you the land, they also give you free electricity in the special economic zones. So I think, uh, yeah, by and large, Benjamin. Yeah, thank you. And I'm putting the last and the important question to Mark what success looks like in India and how would you kind of go about attaining it? Uh, that's probably the hardest question to answer. Because um, I think what success looks like depends on what your expectation is at the start. Um, and that's both in a personal and a business sense. Um, for Hydrodesk, success will be measured on, key for, on two fronts. Firstly, that we're able to successfully bring to market and supply a product that is cost effective and makes safe water available to those that need it. That's the altruistic view of what the strategic plan says. That's why we developed the technology in the first place. The second one is to provide an appropriate financial return to the founders and the investors. And that's really what success will look like for us. We are gonna make a difference to people's lives by improving the quality of the water they get. And for that, we will take a little bit of money off the table to recover, recoup the significant cost we've been, we invested to get to where we are today. Thank you very much. So that brings us to the end of the panel discussion. Uh, quick pointers that I took away. It's, it's a long-term persistent market. It cannot be a touch and go effort for India. Uh, you need to really refine your strategy well. Uh, it's not one market. It could be multiple markets as well. Uh, and due diligence is the key. Uh, that's that's kind of the three mantras that I can throw. What to you, Vic? Thank you very much. Thank you. Hema. Thank you to the panelists as well. So. Thank you so much, Hemant. Um, you can take the questions from here. Absolutely. Expert moderator. And um, many thanks to you, Mark, Benjamin, and Samson. I think a wonderful hearing your experience. My two takeaways, um, a little bit different to what Hemant mentioned. For me, it was, there's never been a better time to do business in India. And second, you got a partner for prosperity. So um, absolutely, plenty of opportunity. And that's what we are here to do is to help you navigate and find the right partners and find your success. Um, and, and, and we do it together. So, you know, um, state, speak to DTI, Austrade from a federal level. Um, together, we've got a big, big network and a lot of contacts, so make sure that we get in touch. I know we've got a few questions that have come in online as well, but um, just over to anyone for any questions for any one of us. Not everyone at once. Um, in market as in Australia. Um, well, there, there's plenty of sessions that we, um, so there, there's throughout the year, there's a calendar of events um, that, you know, whether it's our state partners or whether it's Austrade, um, attending events or taking delegations. So I think um, short answer would be get in touch with us. Um, we can keep you posted on the programs. We're also looking at uh, accelerator programs when you're on the ground in India. So a lot happening in this space, but get in touch. And of course, from a, a practical point of view and making sure that you're aware of everything that's required. You know, you've got the experts like RP in the room as well, and they'll be able to help out. Does that kind of answer? Yeah.
I can talk a little bit about that with the, the gift city. And I think we actually had that delegation over um, a few months ago. And they were looking at specifically speaking to the university sector over here for setting up in gift city, which is one of those special economic zones. Um, I, I can't talk with absolute confidence, but what I do know is that, yes, they are making the, um, the regulatory approvals to operate out of gift city quite seamless with a view that it doesn't clear you to operate in the rest of India, but with a view to try and give you a leg up when you want to try and operate as um, a financial services provider in India. But getting the, the regulations um, that they have enable you to actually do dollar trade out of India based out of Gift City. So there's a few things, but like I said, not the expert, but we can certainly connect you to the experts. Thank 
I think definitely speaks to the complexity of the market. Um, there's one word for anyone that's been to to India, um, and everyone uses it. From um, Barry O'Farrell, the High Commissioner, he used it recently in a in a speech as well. It's called Jugar, which just means th th there's there's always a way in India. <laughs> awesome. Well, guys, thank you so much. It's lovely to meet you all. Um, and yes, thank you. Please thank us for bringing the weather from Sydney. I hear it wasn't that good over the weekend. Very looking forward to exploring the city this evening. But thank you again to um, for everyone for coming out. And uh, yeah, look forward to being in touch. Thank you. Thank you.